there's been a lot of decision points in the company where we're like, all right, if we do this, we will be here or we will accomplish this. And you want everything to be the silver bullet, right? It's like, we'll get on Shark Tank and then boom, we're off to the races forever. And it's like, those things don't really exist. Every single thing is a stepping stone. Like even when we got into CVS, we're like, you know, we'll go into CVS and then boom, you know, we'll triple the company or like whatever will happen from there. It was like, no, it was like we went to CVS and we sold well and like you could just continue, but the real work begins there. Hey, you're going to love this interview with John Shanahan, the co-founder and CMO of Strix. We talk all about the market opportunity for men's cosmetics and skincare, his experience going on Shark Tank and landing a deal, and the lessons that he's taken from his background as a YouTuber into direct-to-consumer retail. John Shanahan, welcome back to Going Deep There in Watson, man. Thanks. Happy to be a repeat guest now. Yes, the uh, the privileged few. We should like publish a list uh, accompanied with this of the folks that we wanted to bring back. Um, and sometimes it's like, let's go deeper on the same topic. And in rare instances, it's like a completely distinct new endeavor. Uh, last time we talked about your YouTube channel, The Cavalier. Uh, basically, right around that time, you co-founded a new company, Strix. So for the folks that are not familiar, haven't recently seen you on Shark Tank, uh, let's give them an update on what the company is, what the mission is, and what you guys are working on. Sure. So still run the Cavalier. That's kind of like the basis for everything that I do. And that's that was what allowed me, I think we talked about the time to quit my job and, and go full time into content creation. And had I known at the time that this is the path that would take me on, I would not have believed you. But here we are a couple of years later. Uh, so Strix is the, we're trying to build the first essentially men's beauty brand. We build skincare and cosmetic products for men. Uh, we launched D2C. We went into CBS in 2020, Nordstrom in 21. And then just in March, we launched Nationwide and Target. So we're putting a concealer on the shelves next to razors and deodorant and other skincare essentials. So breaking some barriers and stigmas there. And also we're very active on TikTok, which is entirely your doing, which uh, I got to give you all the credit in the world for, for one time we had lunch and Aaron said, you know, TikTok's pretty interesting. It's a very powerful editing platform and distribution platform. This was November of 2019. And I went home and I was like, all right, I'll fart around on this TikTok thing. And now it is the number one driver of the growth of our company in a massive way. We've had about 120 million organic views uh, since I started. Wow. And it uh, it's changed it's changed everything. So uh, we can dig into any of those points. And yet, like you mentioned, we were just on Shark Tank May 13th, uh, which was also a crazy process. So uh, if we're going deep, you tell me where you want to start. Yeah, we'll get to Shark Tank. Um, that's partially bearing the lead so that people listen all the way through. And partially, there's like a lot of interviews where they're like, what's Shark Tank like? So we don't want to just completely rehash that. There's specific things to your story that I wanted to make sure we covered. Have you come across Alex Hormozzi yet? Yes. So he has a really, uh, he has a ton of fantastic frameworks, but one that he's said that I've really tried to internalize is people will buy an online course or they'll go build a specific skill set and then it won't immediately translate into success. And they'll be like, that course didn't work. When in reality, it's like that was one of the things they were missing, maybe, but they're actually missing other things before, you know, everything kind of clicks into place. And while, you know, maybe I get some micro modicum of credit for, you know, pointing you in the direction of TikTok first. The reality is, is that the basis for that 120 million organic views, and that is a valid marketing channel, is this amazing Venn diagram of you already had video production skills, content creation skills, marketing basics, track record of speaking to men about their aesthetic, their look. And when that was married to TikTok's super easy content creation engine and the loads of organic distribution that come with a social network on the rise that creators haven't yet hopped onto, you get this really special opportunity that's driven, you know, I'm sure that's part of the entree into all these retailers that you've listed and the direct to consumer sales and success in fundraising and all these other things. So talk a little bit just about that experience of being like, yo, my skill set and the opportunity, the thing right in front of you is so 
almost like perfectly, like the Venn diagram is like almost the two circles are perfectly over top of one another. What's that like? Because that is kind of the thing that the folks that haven't yet found it, it's, it's not product market fit, but it's almost like career opportunity fit is the way I would say it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave it to you to tie all those things together in a way that I hadn't totally done before. Cause I think even when we talked last time, like the reason that I started a YouTube channel is that I took a video production class in high school and like that ended up leading to the YouTube channel. And then at the same time, the other thing that happened with TikTok and YouTube in particular was there was an arms race and there still is for how polished you can make a video. And then that gets you into a deeply technical side of video production that I've never been as much of a fan of. And TikTok is like run and gun, shoot it on the front of your phone, post it as quick as you can. And so that also kind of played in my favor uh, within there. And so I think on the last one too, let me, let me get a twofer here of quoting Steve Jobs. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Where he says, uh, you can't connect the dots looking forward, only looking backward. And it's very true. Like everything that I attempted, tried, failed at, did okay at, like it all ended up leading into this thing, but it's also about seizing the opportunity. So when I went home from the lunch that we had, I posted the video. It's still up on a TikTok page. If you scroll back far enough, it it, it takes a while to scroll back now, but it was half done and it had like 300,000 views. The very first thing. And I was like, there's something here let me keep figuring it out. And then it wasn't from there. It was not just like I started posting where like getting a ton of sales and everything, but there was enough of a signal that I was like, okay, I'm getting views, but I haven't really figured it out. I'm enjoying making the content more on this platform than I am on YouTube. And then there was a lot of experimentation. And so I think our first 10 or 15,000 followers happened really fast. And then it felt, I mean, I could probably find the stats somewhere. It probably took us eight or nine months to go from 20,000 to 50,000 followers. And then again, there was like this plateau each time. And it's, it reminded me when I was a swimmer in high school, I would get faster and I'd beat my time. And then I would just spend like weeks where I couldn't beat it again. And I wasn't at that level again, but it was just like, if you just keep pushing through and you just, you know, it's, it, there's a, there's a mentality to it that you have to have a little bit. And that's what ended up getting us to this point, because if I had given up The first time I plateaued wouldn't be here. If I had given up the second time I plateaued and even like right now, you know, we were sitting around 175,000 for three or four months. And I was just like, I'm just going to keep going because, you know, there's definitely still something here to the wider platform, which is, uh, which is interesting too. What about the message specifically of cosmetics and skincare for men? Partially that drew you in as an opportunity worth pursuing, but then, you know, kind of marry that to how you actually talk about that because it isn't, you know, maybe there's other people like a Gary Vee we've talked about, like who kind of see something like that coming, but the vast majority of people, that's still a shift. There's still stigma. There's still ideas that kind of restrain folks from really wrapping their mind around it. I'd say that is one of the things that gives us a leg up on TikTok is the controversial nature of what we're doing. Like I talk to other founders that run apparel brands, or they run like other brands that they just don't get the same engagement as we do, which for better or worse, I mean, the negative comments that we get are, uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've seen some of them. They're, they're pretty insane. Um, but I also, it's like, it comes back to like a deeply personal thing where it was something that I experienced and I saw that there could be a change and like go make the change that you want to be is really like what ended up pushing me into this. And so like from the clothing thing, it was like, I couldn't find YouTube videos that I wanted to watch about the clothing that I wanted to buy. And then with this, it was okay. There literally is not another product out there that can attack, that can accomplish the same thing that is also making the barrier lower for men. So how do I then like seize on that opportunity. And I also got extremely lucky that a lot of the legwork and a lot of the design and R and D and everything was done by the Strix founding team. And then they had kind of targeted me as like a really good person going forward to help spread the message and, and, and really communicate it in a way that uh, I think I've done pretty well with. And the controversy is kind of this wonderful double-edged sword, like you're saying from an engagement standpoint, but also just from like a psychological standpoint, you have a community, a tribe can only be so coalesced without an enemy. It's like, you know, everyone can kind of turn into infighting or not really care, be that interested. But when there's an enemy at the gate, we rally around one another 
and kind of all point our spears in the in the same direction for lack of a better metaphor. And so there's the like raw engagement of you're getting more comments because I'm sure there's you know all sorts of ridiculous hate coming on every every video that goes up, but it's also the type of thing that the folks that do resonate with it see and you know a, a friend in need is a friend indeed and that's kind of the the psychological trigger there. Yeah, there's that and then there's also again talking to other founders that want to make more TikToks. I also had a thick enough skin from being a YouTuber at that point for four years that I didn't take any of the comments personally, even though you definitely can, it can definitely send you down a spiral. So like I know right now, what is it like uh, the number one career that kids want in, in middle school right now is to be like a YouTuber. And it's like, you don't really know what's out there until you put yourself out there in a big way. And so part of pushing through a lot of it is understanding where it's coming from, the fact that you can't really take it personally. And then you also find what the right message is within there uh, that aligns with everything you're trying to do. And so you also have to kind of like, you know, navigate that. So tell folks just like a little bit more company history. Um, The the initial idea, uh, there was an initial product and then you're now up to, I don't even know if it's a dozen or or where you guys have landed with the amount of products you guys are selling. Yeah, we're a little over 12 now, but when the company launched, and I was I was the first YouTube video for it. It was a, a concealer and a tinted moisturizer because those were the two products that were most most guys were most open to using or have used before. But there was not a uh, an analogous version on the market for guys. And I remember I, it was a diner that we sat in in the Strip District where I was like, "This is a concealer and this is a tinted moisturizer." And you were like, "I get it, I get the concealer." And you're like, "Tinted moisturizer, I." Uh, uh, you know, there's a bigger barrier there uh, to get, you know, to understand what it is. The legibility wasn't as high. Um, and so then as we've continued to go forward, it's always been about blending cosmetics and skincare. And so the additional products that we built were both partially out of what do we see as a gap in the market, but also um, what are our customers asking for? So like the, my favorite example is the gel cleanser that we have. Uh, we developed because Guys are using the concealer, but they either weren't washing their face at night or the more, the cleanser they were using couldn't remove the concealer. So they were getting pigment on their pillow and complaining to us. And so it was like, we created a problem that we had to then solve, but this is like the things you don't really you know think about. Um, and then like our eye tool is one of our best sellers. Guys have a lot of issues around their eyes. They want to fix that a daily SPF. And so the more that we can combine those two, and because we always talk about too, like there's a lot of companies that do shampoo and soap and cologne and like there's a lot of products for guys that are already out there but nobody's really tackling the makeup stuff and like that's our opportunity to really seize um and not get distracted by other product categories that would be easier to jump into can you convey to people how big the cosmetics industry is generally because i that's something that unless you're like a business nerd you don't really appreciate how big it is and how profitable it is yeah so the cpg industry is larger than tech And companies that are being uh, acquired and in that space have the same or higher multiples than tech companies, but it's not as uh, new of a space, I think is why it doesn't get the same attention. But if you look at the major conglomerates that own every CPG brand, like they're snapping up companies the same way tech companies do. And I remember I had that realization one time when I was still at First Insight, because like I think it was when Muscle Milk was acquired by Pepsi. Or it was like it was one of those type of transactions that was for like two hundred fifty million dollars. And I was like, "Wow!" I was like, "You can build a food brand and sell it to a major conglomerate." And then um, in the beauty industry, it's even more active because there are so many new innovations in the beauty space that major companies can't really get right with a with a level of authenticity, and so they just want to pick up like the company that did it correctly, and then bring it into the fold. Schmidt's deodorant is a great example. I know you follow those guys on uh, on Twitter. So Jamie uh, Jamie and Chris, they built Schmidt's, which is a nat- natural deodorant or Moyes uh, with Native, sold to P&G. Um, but yeah, the beauty, the beauty industry in particular, I want to say is $35 billion. Like it's big and that's all women's. And then in the men's space, Men's personal care is somewhere around five billion, but men's is the fastest growing sector of CPG overall, uh, which I always attribute to. We're riding the wave of like the Mad Men era. Like Mad Men showed guys that skinny ties and nice suits are nice, or like get a nice haircut. And then there was a beard era where everybody wanted to get their beard products, and like 
beard grooming became more acceptable. Now we're in the manscaped era. And like our bet is that the next logical progression of that is like, all right, you've got your beard and you've got your haircut in lock, your beard in lock, you're doing your skincare routine, but no matter how much good skincare you do, you're still going to get some kind of blemish or something and you need that instant fix. And so that's where we try to fit in. And the other thing that, you know, so full disclosure here, listeners, I've only ever made my wife and I have only ever made one angel investment and it's into Strix. And the first basis for that decision was, you know, I I don't have the experience to speak to this, but every great angel investor always talks about it starts with who the actual entrepreneur is. And you are just one of the entrepreneurs that is on the short list of like, whatever you're into, I'm into because I just know that you have the, the kind of discipline, the creativity, the work ethic to create really cool results. But the second thing in addition to the, the the TikTok thing really working, that's like a distribution channel for marketing that really like, I don't want to reduce the hard work of building this company to something, you know, very simple, but the the concept of this product line that you guys are laying out is we already know that cosmetics is enormous. Like we have these enormous CPG companies, but also like, you know, beauty and luxury are, are like also tied together. And, you know, Bernard are known these enormous conglomerates just, you know, they gobble up the Kardashian or the, or the, you know, Rihanna's different beauty lines because those things are just cash cows. If you have the customers coming in because, because of the margin structure and the, a lot the, the, the setup of products, maybe like lipstick isn't on some sort of, uh, you know, short time horizon for the type of cosmetics that men would potentially be using, but the, the, the universe of potential products is already legible. The, the job is basically find the ones that are most relevant, reformat them to this male audience that you're engaging with. And, and, and any sort of risk about like product is, I don't want to say completely off the table, but massively reduced relative to other types of startups that might be in a similar stage to you where we're still not sure if like this product, we can get this product to work or there is enough market appetite or, or what have you. Does that, does that res- register with you where it's like, hey, we, we kind of look to this universe of cosmetics products that are already in place uh, for the, wi- with the women's market and just figuring out, kind of plucking the ones that would be best for this audience that we're speaking to? Yeah, because th- the biggest thing in the women's space is it's very saturated. Women spend, I mean, women spend way more on their face than, than men ever uh, have. And, you know, the idea is that they'll get there. Uh, but in order to innovate in the women's space is like, is very difficult because every product is made and in the men's space. It's kind of this green open pasture where the products really just need particular tweaks to make them more for guys, whether it be accounting for guys, oilier skin, or the fact that guys don't have a beauty routine. Like we can't assume that a guy's going to have a beauty blender and a setting pad. Like there's a lot of, there's formulation tweaks to that, but we know that there's products guys are already stealing from their wives or girlfriends or their partners, and they want a, a brand that speaks to them and a product that is a little more tailored to them. And so, yes, there's like, there's, there's just, there's so much low hanging fruit in this space that I think I, it's, it's, it's curious to me why it hasn't been tackled, but then it's like, that's the opportunity for us to, to build that defining brand uh, in the space. Do you think part of the why is just in general, how much more everyone sees themselves? So like, like this is like, you know, used to be just your mirror in the morning and then like, oh, I'm passing by a window. Oh, I don't like have mud on my clothes or something. And then now it's, you know, we're on a remote call right now. People are used to looking at Zoom, used to seeing themselves in an Instagram story or a FaceTime or what have you. There's just a greater kind of conscientiousness brought to one's appearance. Is that what you see as like a primary driver? Yeah, it's it's more self awareness, not just it's it's Zoom calls. Every it's like when you go out to lunch with your friends, it's gonna go on Instagram. It's like everybody's on camera in really nice cameras now. It's not flip cam, it's not flip phone cameras and like low quality stuff. It's like you're seeing yourself a lot more than you ever were. But there's also there's also a, a better understanding now that you can do things about it. And it, it's like a lot of the comments that we get, they're like what is a, there's like, what is a concealer? Like, I had no idea you could even do this. Or it's like, you're telling me I can hide my dark under eye circles. Like, tell me more about that. And it's, it's, there's a, just a lack of awareness and education for men in this space um, that I experienced firsthand. And so that's part of why, you know, social has been such a big thing is like, you can just really explain this stuff and then leave it to them. We're not saying you have to use this stuff, but a lot of guys want it. They just don't know it's out there. 
Uh, and the flip side of that is they've used these products before because like the one we hear the most common is like, man, I had a black eye once for picture day. My mom put concealer on that stuff's amazing. And it's like, yeah, that's like the thing a lot of guys have, whether it's, you know, from a partner or something else. Um, and, and just making that more tailored to guys is really what has opened this up. Right on. So, uh, we're about to get to shark tank, but first you referenced, uh, CVS Nordstrom target. And what was the fourth retailer that you guys are in? We're in a, we're in a few other like smaller retails, but I mean, those are the, the main ones. The big dogs. So can you talk, so this is really like uh, of a different era, but when the whole direct to consumer boom started and we saw some of these early Casper companies like that get uh, funded, there was this, you know, initial, oh, this is a completely new paradigm. Everyone's just going to go to your website, order from you. You're going to ship it to them. Never need a storefront, never need any sort of physical presence. And now these days, like you walk in to Target and there's an end cap for like all those D2C companies on their respective section of Target to, uh, you know, be able to reach more uh, prospective buyers because that's how, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many uh, runs I've made to Target in the last couple months for things that we needed uh, at some point in time. So can you talk specifically about the upstart CPG company playbook? for earning a spot or paying for a spot or gaining relevance in some of these big retailers and just what that kind of step-by-step -step process is from getting in and getting your foot in the door to having the foot traffic and sales to garner greater presence in those retailers. Yeah. So D2C was quickly uh, associated as like a new business model versus being what it is, which is a distribution model. Uh, but the, the, yeah, you're, you're right. There was a whole era of brands and I think you could probably find the quotes from like Warby Parker or, you know, name, name your D2C brand that was like, we will never be in retail. It's like, that's just how it is. And their, their tune has changed. Um, but to go to use D2C as a way to kick things off, like the barrier to entry is very low. You can get a Shopify set up really easily, build the brand and then prove the concept. But ultimately e-commerce penetration is like 30 ish percent right? Give or take what it is right now. I think it's contracting right now, you know, for macro, macro reasons. So you can only reach 30% of consumers that are going to buy online. 70% of retail still happens in physical brick and mortar stores. And so that that's kind of the thesis for why we went early. The other side of it is specific to our product and our category. We feel that we need to be in those stores on the shelves next to established brands and products to show that guys can use these. There's a stigma breaking to it which is why we're in the men's section, not in the beauty section. Um, but to get into retail, it's, I mean, it's very tough. Everybody wants to get into retail. So there's, there's buyers at these companies that all they do is evaluate new products, new brands, and figure out what's in the market. I would say 1% of brands get plucked, right? From, you know, if they're, if they're growing fast enough, a retailer reach out and be like, hey, you know, we love what you're doing. Come on in. Everything else is relationships and sales. And that's part of like, when you're talking about connecting the dots, my my experience doing business development and sales at First Insight is what entirely informed the way that I sold into retailers and investors uh, for for Strix. And so, with CVS in particular, they looked at Target and said, "Target is bringing in cool brands. It's bringing in cool consumer, like you new younger consumers. How do we do that on our side?" And so that made it easy for us too, because we were also. I mean, none of this is easy, but our positioning because you have to also position to the retailer what you're bringing to the table is you can put another beard oil or another razor on your shelf, but you're not growing the category. We are bringing in, we're like our product is sitting alongside these other products. We have enough customer data to have these similar products in your store. And so, hey, this is a way to grow the category. You're growing the whole pie. Um, and so you have to figure out what your story is to the retailer for how you're going to bring that unique value. Um, one of the brands that I've become close with is Quip. And what they what what they said their story to Target was is that something like 80% of Quip customers, they're an electric toothbrush, were coming from standard non-electric toothbrushes. And so they were able to go to Target and say, you know, if we capture 30% of the toothbrush buyers that were coming in for a non-electric toothbrush, we can convert them. We're showing we can convert them. And we're going to, you know, your margins and your sales revenues can be this much higher because these are the customers that are coming in to buy from us online. And they've been extremely successful in Target uh, from that positioning. And so it's really about figuring out what the retailer's initiatives are 
and how you can then supplement and add to that and, and bring those in. Um, and so part of that is traction on your D2C, on your website, or if you have, you know, smaller, especially in food, it's really common to go to smaller local shops and then you can start to work your way into the Whole Foods and, and the larger stores like that. But ultimately it's, I keep, I keep telling people, it's like, it's smiling, dialing, it's finding the right person, the right buyer to take a chance on you and also not giving up because there's a lot of brands that will apply three, four or five times and it's just not the right time and you just got to keep building and growing and then go back and, and it will be the right time. So consistency and effort underpins all uh, uh, kind of sales attempts, but I, I really want to just try to rehash some of the things you said, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on these points, because I, I also talk to people who are like, they want to sell, they want to be better salespeople, but you know, do I have the right talking points? Do I actually know the like levers that make things happen? So one of them is um, like if you can just prove sales in some way, shape or form, Hey, we were in this small, you know, boutique retailer and we sold out or we had really great numbers. Um, two, we have this thesis for how we drive value to you. We're deeply empathetic to you, the retailer and your goals and our ability to, you know, not, Hey, we would love to have our yada yada sold there, but it would help you accomplish goal X, Y, or B. And then once you're actually in the door, it's always going to be some form of a, a kind of limited run test actually following through and saying, Hey, this was the thesis we had. This was the result. And that's going to be distinct to each product really, because sometimes it is about, you know, better capitalizing the average toothbrush buyer. And in other cases it's, Hey, you know, no one comes in and buys three different razors, but there will be people who buy a razor and a Strix concealer. Yes. Yes, exactly. All of that tied together to make you guys a worthy subject for Shark Tank. Tell us a little bit the story about the story of how that came together. And then we can talk about the deal that you guys closed. Yeah, what's crazy is when we started the Shark Tank process, we weren't in Target yet. We actually had the, the same week that we had our initial call with Target, we had our initial call with the Shark Tank producers. And so those two things were always kind of running in parallel. Um, and it was crazy that they happened. They ended up coming to life so close together. Um, so yeah, we got in touch with a producer. Shark Tank, in the contrary to retailers, Shark Tank does reach out to a lot of companies. Shark Tanks, I mean, their ultimate goal is to fill their pipeline with cool, interesting companies, products, and founders, and then get them whittled down to like a really solid uh, lineup. And so I do know of a lot more companies that have been... Um, you know, reached out to from Shark Tank. But I also know a lot of companies that just go through the website like us. It's like you apply on the website, you, you say your cool thing, and you just hope you get a call back. And there's a lot of companies that will get that. And then the process is, you know, you go, you go through a real process, you put a reel together, and then you get approved, and then you do the producer, um, you know, thing, and you start to refine your pitch. And then ultimately, you get to film. And what's crazy is, something like 20, 25% of filmed pitches still never see the light of day. I know four other companies that filmed this season that they'll, their episode never see the light of day. And so there's like, there's all these kind of uh, break points where you could not end up, you know, seeing the, 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 the filming at all or ever seeing your episode. Tons of companies get it filmed, never see your stuff on the episode. Keep going. Yeah. So there's all these break points where you could end up never seeing the light of day. And they're very clear about that too. Like they say until basically they say, until you are walking through those doors on national television, your episode is not guaranteed to air. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of people that it's cause it's a lot of work. There's like, there's tons of paperwork and, and backend stuff that you have to do to get on there. And so I'm sure there's companies that you know, go through that process and they get frustrated with them that it never ep ended up episode airing. I believe it. So uh, let's talk about, I mean, so part of that has to be like, let's make this pitch really entertaining. In addition to having a great product, it probably helps to either get a really good deal done or be like shut down by everyone in a really fascinating way. Um, so, you know, just give us, give us like what your strategy was going into that, how you thought about preparing for something I've heard, you know, you, you actually record for an hour plus to get that distilled down into the highlights that they're actually going to show. So what was that like? Yeah. I think the thing to remember is that the goal of the show is to make the sharks look really good and everything else is kind of like serving that purpose and, and ultimately showing the, you know, the products and everything and the entrepreneurs. But the goal of the show is to make the sharks look good. And when we are preparing, the only thing, yeah, we filmed for about an hour. The only thing that's scripted is that first 
30 or 60 seconds, right? It's that it's the pitch and then it's a free for all. And luckily we had raised money in the past. So we've like gone through those meetings, but the difference with shark tank is every question that we wanted to answer. We essentially had to answer to the audience first, the sharks second, and then like investors third. So like when we were thinking about the way we would respond to some of the questions that we typically get, it's like, how do we answer it so that it answers the audience watching because they're the ones that are ultimately the most important on the show and then also answers the shark's question. And then the other thing too, is you've got five big personalities in the room that are all trying to make great TV. So they're all trying to talk over each other, interrupt you, see if you're good on your feet. And so you kind of have to like choose who you're going to answer at what point and what got edited. There's a lot of stuff that got edited out of the episode, but we didn't answer the revenue question for like 20 minutes. And Kevin he was like red in the face. He was like, what is happening here? Which is why in our episode, Robert goes, I knew it because we kept ignoring Kevin. He was like revenue, revenue. And then Damon was like revenue, revenue. And then when we finally answered it, they're all like, oh, okay. And that like makes sense. And so, um, yeah, just having that in the back of your mind of like, how do you also just make this as entertaining as possible? You have to keep that in mind too, because that's what they want to, you know, they want to make great TV. Once again, it helps to have years and years of content creation experience going into that, but not every company has. Yeah. I joke with people all the time. Like I spend my whole day talking to a camera. So it's like, it's great to do. It's great to do stuff like this and have somebody else to talk to. Yeah. To bounce off of. So you landed a deal, Robert Herge. I'm going to miss, I literally like tried to say his name and I still have like some sort of blockage. Uh, just what is, what has kind of been the the result so far? So, you know, one of those things with those companies not getting on the show, they don't get the, uh, accompanying, uh, sales bump that tends to come with everyone rushing to the site after watching the show, but also you've got a shark on your balance sheet. You have fresh capital to continue to deploy. What's that look like? Yeah. So they ended up, ended up editing out some of the negotiations too, which I thought were entertaining. It's like they, they encourage that. Um, ultimately Robert has uh, not come through on some of the promises. I don't know how much more to talk about there, but um no, we've grown the company. We stopped burning cash and we landed Target all without additional help. Uh, we would love to have him uh, on board because I know there's a lot of benefit to having those. But ultimately, yeah, it just hasn't uh, hasn't been one of the factors that has led to the growth, which is reassuring and exciting. But also, you know, maybe we would have gone faster if we had the additional cash and uh, had the additional guidance on there. But uh, I think that's all I can say. Fair enough. What about just like when the show aired? Did you see like a crazy spike in traffic to the website, to the TikTok account? Like what, what did that look like? Yeah, what's crazy is we were on a list for Q1 of the fastest growing D2C brands that's tracked by similar web and that ended in March. And so I'm really curious if we'll hit that again, but in, in, uh, in Q2 because yeah, the traffic to the site was crazy. We never had... We've never been close to that many concurrent sessions because as so- and, it's, and it's as soon as we walked out into the tank, right? You just saw the spike because we had the, we had our logos on our shirts, so people Google it. And the what's what's also interesting because I know other founders have been on previous seasons is because streaming is so prevalent now. It isn't just that eight p.m. on a Friday night thing. It's once it hits Hulu 24 hours later, then Saturday, then Sunday. And like, I'm still getting texts today where they're like, I just got around to watching your episodes. So like, there's the, since the appointment viewing is, is such a thing now, it's like, you know, people are going to pick up on Shark Tank throughout the week. And so I think, whereas before it used to be really intense on that, that one, you know, two hour segment when the episode airs, it's kind of spread out across a few days, which I think is great. And, you know, we've definitely seen that continue and we've ultimately, just hit like a new daily baseline of revenue, um, like post shark tank, which I'm hoping doesn't slow down. It's, it's been really good. But at the same time, we also, I had like three different videos do over a million views that same weekend. So it was just like, everything is just, is just rising and it's been crazy to try and continue that momentum. And, um, you know, we hired a head of growth, uh, on January and part of the edict with him was like, look, we got TikTok really cranking here. But we need other stuff to be working because all of our attention is going into this one channel. And we saw that for the first time in March where you know we had a viral video in March and we had this really long tail that we never had on our TikToks before. And it's the same thing with Shark Tank where it's like, all right, so 
you know, Shark Tank is going to be a huge uh, traffic driver, but how do we then leverage that into, you know, spinning up every other channel? It's like, we want to make sure if people are Googling for what they saw, if, it, if they're Googling for men's Shark Tank concealer, like got to hit there. And then how do we then leverage, you know, the Shark Tank uh, appearance into to the more social validation that it's worth? And so that's been the other thing to kind of lean into. Yeah. One of the other, I mean, it, it it's, it was prudent to have that growth person ready to go. And I'd, I'd be curious to learn more about just like how you evaluate for someone like that. But the other thing that j- just, you know, brings to mind where you could see that kind of lift uh, moving into the future is almost like the Volkswagen effect where they say like you, you go buy a Volkswagen and all of a sudden you see all the other Volkswagens that are on the road with you. And to that same effect, if you do have, you know, the, the placement in Target, CVS, Nordstrom, someone who otherwise would walk by and it just, it would be part of that, you know, morass of things that cross your visual spectrum that you never actually like consciously recognize your ability to now jump out to them amongst that morass because of the fact that they listened to you guys pitch for whatever it was, eight minutes on Shark Tank, potentially creates a bit more of that lift now and in the future. Because someone could watch that and then come back however many weeks later and see it. And that, you know, maybe that translates to sales or maybe that translates to them telling someone about it, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest lessons is there's been a lot of decision points in the company where we're like, all right, if we do this, we will be here or we will accomplish this. And you want everything to be the silver bullet, right? It's like, we'll get on Shark Tank and then boom, we're off to the races forever. And it's like, there really aren't, those things don't really exist. Every single thing is a stepping stone. Like even when we got into CVS, we're like, you know, we'll go into CVS and then boom, you know, we'll triple the company or like whatever will happen from there. It was like, no, it was like we went to CVS and we sold well and like you could just continue, but the real work begins there. And it was very much that way with Shark Tank where it was like, we did all this work to get, get up to Shark Tank and, and get to the air date, but then- it was like, that's when the real work begins and it just becomes another stair step on this thing. And like everything, I think everybody's looking for that silver bullet, but it's really just, just continuing to put in the time and the effort, uh, from there. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect kind of lesson or insight to, uh, wrap up with here, John, anything else you're hoping to share today that I didn't give you a chance to before we ask the last two questions? No, I think I said on the last, uh, episode is like, listen, I listen to these every week. I feel like I might be one of the most uh, avid listeners to the podcast. I think you do great work. And I think your ability to pluck interesting people that I haven't heard, like, cause I feel like I see a lot of the same people in some of the podcast circuits, but your ability to, to pluck them and then also ask really insightful questions is what keeps me coming back. So, uh, a very public kudos to you on, on continuing. Um, very kind of you. Thank you. Um, for folks that want to learn more about Strix, follow all the things that you guys are doing, what digital coordinates can we provide for people to learn more? We are Strix underscore official everywhere. Uh, and yeah, we do the most stuff on TikTok. And then we're trying to get a little bit better about putting stuff on LinkedIn just because there's some cool stuff happening. And so, yeah, Strix official pretty much everywhere. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about before we go to the challenge here is earlier in the life of Strix, one of the kind of company values was subtlety, I believe, or, or maybe that's not the quite right discreet. word. Discreet. Um, and, you know, it, it, that's kind of the premise of, you know, covering up some small blemishes on your face. And so there was this like weird tension between wanting to tell everyone about what you're doing and also kind of having some discretion about details of the company. Obviously, there's one question here earlier where that was... Uh, was touched upon, but is that still a value? Have that, is, is that maybe like something that has been shed to some degree? How are you thinking about that in the context of building a brand? Yeah, it probably creates the most discomfort for me because I'm also that way personally and like spending time to put up stuff on LinkedIn and like brag humbly or not so humbly is like very uncomfortable. And so it's part of the reason that, that the brand value is discreet is because it very much comes from the founders and, and my co-founders the same way as well. And, um, yeah, even like the way that we, like we've never really announced a fundraising round because that doesn't like drive, to us it doesn't drive the company or the mission forward. And so, um, but yeah, with all of our products, you know, the discreet nature remains, but it, there is that kind of tension where you have to be like, you have to announce these things and you have to be very public about it, but also at the same time, like how do we keep our heads down and just continue grinding on those? Um, so yeah, that's definitely that's definitely one of the kind of balances that we're always looking for in the company. Word. Well, we're going to link to all the strict stuff here in the show notes. Uh, you can find it in the podcast app. 
uh, or going deep with Aaron.com slash podcast for every single episode of the show. But before I let you go, John, I would like to give you the mic one final time to issue a challenge to the audience. I think you to try something new that makes you uncomfortable. And like in the context of Strix, it's, you know, guys trying concealer, but you know, if there's something that you've been interested in doing, it's like, take that little leap and try it. Because for me, and that was TikTok. I mean, there's a lot of things I've done the past couple of years that have been that way. Um, but you know, growth happens in discomfort. And if you're not making an effort to do that more often, I think you'll be surprised at the results you see. Yeah. I can tell you that, uh, we, just hired, and I mentioned this a couple episodes ago, an ops person. And that was very uncomfortable for me because every previous hire for Piper had been exclusively video editors. And it was like very uh, discreet in a different sense of the word, where it's like, I knew what it took to be a good one. I kind of knew how to evaluate whether or not they were good. But like the ops thing, I was like, I don't really have a clear definition of the things that need done because I'm all over the place administratively. And it's been uh, a, a wonderfully um, beneficial challenge so far that, uh, definitely pushed me outside my comfort zone, but has already yielded some positive stuff. So I love that challenge. And I think that everyone should take it. Yeah. It could be hiring or it could be like, go run a little bit further tomorrow. It's like, yeah. just be uncomfortable. Amen to that. John, this has been fantastic. Thanks for coming on the show, man. Of course. And, and congratulations on the baby. Haven't said that publicly either. It's great to see you, uh, grown in dad life. Thank you. We just went deep with John Shanahan. Hope you're out there has a fantastic day. Hey, thanks for watching to the end of my interview with John. If you found it insightful and want more insights from him specific to building his YouTube channel with over 100,000 subscribers, check out our past interview from a couple years ago, right as he was at the precipice of founding Strix, where we talk about his YouTube channel, The Cavalier.